Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. This is Malcolm Hawker, your host of CDO Matters, the podcast focused on enabling chief data officers to become truly data driven. I'm excited today to be joined by Laura Madsen, who is the CEO of Moxie Analytics, a professional services company focused on helping companies enable thriving data cultures where everyone is equipped with the knowledge and tools to be better, to ask better questions and get better, faster answers. Uh, Laura is the author of three books, Disrupting Data Governance, Healthcare Business Intelligence, which just had its 10 year anniversary. Congratulations, 10 years, it's awesome. Uh, Data Driven Healthcare is her third book. Um, so obviously incredibly intelligent in the space around BI analytics. I'm really excited to talk more today about data governance, which is an area that, that Laura has written about extensively and helps her clients with extensively. Um, it, it's interesting. I reached out to uh, to Laura a couple of days ago and said, "Hey, you know, uh, do you have a bio that we want to use for the podcast? Because we put you know uh, bios up of all of our speakers because because you, the audience, want to know who they are." And I went and bought Laura's book a couple of days ago, the Disrupting Data Governance uh, book on uh, Amazon. And right on Amazon, and I'm going to read word for word. It says, "Laura Madsen isn't shy about her dislike for formal bios." <laughs> To her, they come across as stuffy and disingenuous. Two things Laura is absolutely not. She's a lifelong learner and champion for intentional inclusion and gender equity matters through organizations like SysTech and She Talks Data. So anyway, we won't dis we won't spend too much time on your uh, your bio and, and and your experience. Obviously, you know the space and you're living and breathing in the space. Uh, but I but I think the little I included the little quip about. Uh, about your bio, uh, just to give a little more insight in, in, in who you are and kind of what makes you tick. And one of the reasons why we're talking today, um, also because you, you are a self-described rebel. It's actually in your in your tagline of, of, of your LinkedIn description. So with that, thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure to have you on CDO Matters today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's 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 dive into it. Um, okay. So I, I read a lot of things in disrupting data governance that really resonated with me and I think will resonate with our listeners as well. Sure. Some of the things that I enjoyed are you kind of laid out the state of the nation, as it were, and it was published in 2019, um, but I suspect you largely believe that the state of the nation has not changed much. Would you agree in, in three years? Um. Yes, I mean, you know, I mean, these are big efforts to turn around and we've been practicing these um, methods for decades. So, yep. yeah, there definitely is, uh, you know, slow shift. I would say, though, that since the book has been published, some of the worst um, offenders, things like a pair, you know, a page long definition of data governance has disappeared off the interwebs, um, which I deeply appreciate. Um, but yes, for the most part, most organizations are still practicing a lot of what would be considered, you know, sort of traditional ways of data governance. Okay, so I, I queued that up because what I like about the book is you laid out the state of the nation, which is largely the same. I started my career at Gartner in 2019. So over, over the three years that I was there taking inquiries about data governance and helping organizations, you know, solve for data governance, I would totally agree. Um, I largely failed sadly, at, at, at significantly moving the needle from a data governance perspective, so for, for better or worse. But the best part about the book to me is, is that you do lay out a framework for how to solve things, right? Mm -hmm. There's the, so, so I would certainly recommend to our readers to go, to go or to our audience to go read the book. Uh, the first line of the book says, uh, you're laughing because you know what the line is. The first line of the book says, I really hate data governance. And that was a fabulous hook for me to, 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 to keep going. But I've got to say, Laura, after reading it, I, I think it's a little bit of love hate. W would you agree? It's kind of like the you love to hate it, but you hate to love it. Um, I mean, so I get a lot of I get a lot of. Um, so we call it feedback about the first line of that book. <laughs> um, and certainly there's an aspect, I suppose, of it that's sort of love hate. There's also an aspect of it that I, I'm just a little masochistic, right? When I see something that is wrong or lacking maybe logic. And I, and I do think that a lot of the ways we think about data governance now lack logic um, mm. in, a modern, in a modern data environment. Um, 
I just tend to want to blow those things up. And um, so there, there's a fair part of me that I really still struggle with data governance as a result of that because there, we, we're still doing a lot of the stuff. Um, what I, where you probably hear a lot of the um, sort of affection come through is, you know, I've been doing data for a really long time. Um, and I still think that there's a way more hope and promise for this work than there isn't. And uh, when I work with clients, the thing that gets me excited is this idea that we can work on things and, and improve them together um, and, and hopefully solve some of these bigger issues more than it is that I just really love or hate data governance. It's interesting you use the word masochist. Um, <laughs> Because uh, in many ways, I would I would describe myself the exact same way. When people have asked me, why do you do what you do, right? And wh why are you talking about best practices? And why are you a thought leader? I know you don't <laughs> like the word. I don't. I know you don't like the phrase thought leader. But but why why do you choose to be a thought leader? My answer to that question is is that I like solving really really hard things, yep. right? I and it sounds like that, that that you're you're there as well. I I I'm. I'm intrigued by the notion of you needing to blow it up. Uh, the, the, the exact words that you use in your own book is data governance is broken. There's no way to make incremental changes to fix it, which is in line with this notion of, of blowing it all up. Now, I would, I would argue that you, that you do actually have a bit of a roadmap and an incremental approach to governance where, where in terms of what you, what you lay out, mm -hmm. but, uh, I, I do tend to agree with you. I think that a lot of things are broken. Uh, so, so you use the word illogical approaches to data governance. Um, you also use the, I'm paraphrasing you now, I think you just said the kind of older school or legacy approaches, yeah. non-modern maybe right. a, a way to right. say it. Yeah. Can you give us a, a couple of examples of what some of these illogical approaches would be? Sure, sure. Yeah, it, so the big thing is when I started writing the book in 2018, um, and, and by the way, I never, I never intended to write a book about data governance. Hmm. It was not on my radar at all. Uh, but I left my corporate job in 2018 and started sort of doing a lay of the land in the data industry. I'd been in it for two decades at that point. And, you know, when you're running programs like this, you go very heads down and you just kind of do the work, right? And you're, you know, I was building a modern data platform and I was you know, working with my staff and I just... I didn't really care about the landscape. So fast forward, I, I leave that job. I decide I'm going to, you know, go out and, and uh, work as a consultant again. And uh, I did a little bit of research and I, and I found the thing that kept coming back for me was data governance was the Achilles heel of most programs and our ability to deliver results. And the, the, the simplest thing I did is I, I Googled data governance and I wanted to know how people were defining it. And it, it came back with a page long definition. And I'm not kidding. It was two paragraphs and it was a full page. And I remember distinctly, I shut my browser, I stepped away from my laptop and I was like, oh, I got to write that book, you know? <laughs> There's got to be a better way. <laughs> I just like, um, like there's, how do you succeed with anything that's a page long? in terms of how you describe the work and knowing where I had come from and how difficult it is in terms of operationalizing the effort, I knew that there was a better way to break it down. And I also knew at that point that the way we had created data governance, so think about it like this, right? The first sort of concept around data stewardship, I, I believe, and I'm sure somebody will correct me, was um, referenced right about the time that the Corporate Information Factory, the late 90s, was a popular sort of primary book on this space, written, of course, by Bill Inman and Claudia Imhoff. And, and so when I talked to Claudia about this concept of data stewards, she was literally like, well, we had data warehouses, which were tiny compared to the stuff we have now. Mm -hmm. And we literally needed the business to steward this stuff for us because we were just pulling data in and landing it. We didn't have contextual information about the data. And they liked the term data steward because they were stewarding the information. And hence, this whole thing was born in a space where in the late 90s, most of our data warehouses, and I was, you know, out in the space by then, um, were, you know, maybe 
a handful of tables, 20, 30 tables, right. a couple hundred thousand rows, maybe maybe millions of rows in your entire data warehouse. And nothing in terms of the construct of data governance changed from the late 90s to when I Googled that definition in 2019. Two decades. And I promise you, there's very few things I'm doing that I did in the late 90s. Thank God I'm, you know, uh, that ship has sailed. Uh, but why are we still doing the same things with data governance in the data space? It's it. That's why it's illogical to me. It's very illogical to me. And so that's hence the book was born. Seems like some definition of insanity stuff. <laughs> now, I think some would argue that some of those approaches, at least from maybe a compliance or legal or audit framework may be still appropriate, maybe. You, you, you go to great lengths to kind of challenge the notion of, of centralized paradigms of, of governance, command and control paradigms in, in, in data governance. I mean, that, that's something you really, really focus on. Mm -hmm. I think there, there, there could be a case where you could argue for command and control for some processes, in some use cases and in some industries, but certainly not all. One of the things that you focus on extensively is the notion of context, yeah. right? And, and, and you just mentioned the, that, that now yeah. and how important context is, is because one person's context is different from another, is different from another and on and on. So, right. so, so I think this notion of context centricity well aligns to a lot of the things that I'm, at least I'm hearing about in the market today. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, but I would argue are a massive, a massive leap for a lot of companies. I just came back from oh. the, you, okay, you, you you agree, okay. Absolutely. I, I came back from the, the Gartner Data and Analytics Summit in Orlando where, where, where some of my very close friends uh, were, were presenting these ideas, largely wrapped around the notion of what they would call adaptive forms of, of governance. That's the word that, that, that they like to use. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I'm like, man, that sounds awesome and really hard. Because if it, was, if it was hard to do one set of if-thens, mm -hmm. right, that were, were, were forced upon everybody for better or worse, right. the, the idea of having hundreds or maybe even thousands of sets of if-thens right. seems like a big jump. What, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. You know, it, it's one of the areas, I think, from a data quality perspective that we struggle with. It's that kind of fit for purpose, right, or context um, driven data quality um, and 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 so what happens from a scale perspective is that you have an enormous amount of variability and and that's one of the things we try to reduce of course in data is that you know as you're, as you're trying to exercise the word control over your data right you try to reduce the variability because otherwise how do you do it how do you execute the work so you know context is king and it always will be because from a data perspective, um, it, it's very difficult to gain information out of data that doesn't have context. Um, the, the truth is that data is not binary, not really, right? Not and not in the way that we use it in the industry. It's not. It's not binary. So, I think where we struggle with with the context piece is um, in a lot of spaces that we could actually um, avoid even needing to worry about it. So. Here's a great here's a great example. Um, for a very long time and and still often, uh, companies think that they have to have one definition of something. And I'm don't. an MDM guy, so you 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 you're talking my language right now. Yeah, don't don't have <laughs> one definition of something, right? And again, it's like I just I, one of the things I really want people to take away from the book is to think about something. You know, it, if you don't want to blow the whole thing up, that's fine. Don't blow the whole thing up. But I want you to look critically at what you're executing, what's not working, and try to figure that piece out. So let's just talk about definitions of data for a hot minute. In what reality do we want everybody to be operating off of one definition of something? For one thing, it takes you forever to get there. For another thing, what about my reality is the same as your reality? The one I use in the book is I am very comfortable with the idea that a nurse manager has a different definition of patient than a finance manager does. And I think it's completely OK. And as a data governance leader, don't chase that down because you're chasing your tail. You know, let them have different definitions when it matters. 
So that's the context. They each have a different context. When it matters is when you want to make sure that you have a better sense of um, management around it. And that's when you're comparing, you're comparing units, you're comparing departments, you're comparing campuses, then everybody should be using the same thing because that's just good math, right? Um, but, but the rest of the time, we chase our tail way too often trying to get everybody on the same quote unquote page. And it's one of the reasons why I love to, you know, I love to uh, poke on the single source of truth thing because um, there is no such thing. There's no single source of truth. We need to stop trying. <laughs> Uh, so, so I agree. A, a single version of the truth is is a panacea that will never exist. And sure. couldn't agree more. Yep. And I couldn't agree more that that context should fuel data definitions at an operational level, right? Yep. That that to paraphrase you, it's okay for a nurse to define a patient different than somebody in the billing department would define a patient totally and completely acceptable. And this is something that our governance program should be able to support and our technology should be able to support. But to your point, if the CEO asks how many customers do we have, there can only really be one answer. You better be able to answer one way. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So I, this may be a little nuancey, but the way that the, the, the phrasing that I used for my clients is, is that there's really no such thing as a single version of the truth, but a single source Yes, you could technically have a single source, whether that source is a governance program, whether it's an MDM hub, whether it's something else. I think it may be a little hair splitty, um, but single version um, mm -hmm. for, for the companies that I've spoken to, a, a handful of companies could still operate that way. And they tend to be making like, you know, uh, very process centric manufacturing companies that are making like medical devices, maybe, sure. right? Or or, the, or or maybe jet engines or other things that, that where people's lives are literally on the line, but totally, totally agree with you. So to data quality, mm -hmm. um, I was constantly ref given these blasts of refreshment in your book <laughs> because you, you, kept, you kept hammering home this notion that quality is not absolute, yeah. Amen. And you kept <laughs> hammering home the notion that you'll never get to 100 percent. Right. Here, here. Yeah. Could, could, couldn't agree more. To, 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 to quote you, here's the quote. There's really no such thing as clean data. Not when you're talking about the accuracy of petabytes of data. It's just not feasible to guarantee it's cleanliness. Right. Yet, yet, <laughs> as you note rightfully in your book, so many companies still chase it and mm -hmm. still spend a lot of money with data quality as a dependency of digital transformation, mm -hmm. supply chain optimization, of, sure. of in, insert strategic project name here. <laughs> right, right. I still talk with companies that are like, well, we have to clean our data. What do you yeah. say to those companies? Well, I certainly don't want to discourage clean data. Um, I mean, we should all aspire to, to be our very best selves. <laughs> um, and the data should aspire to be its very best self. Uh, where it becomes dangerous is, you know, when you're willing to throw everything sort of against that without, again, really critically thinking what that means. Um, I would I would venture to say that even organizations that focus a lot on it don't ever get close to what looks like, you know, quote unquote, clean data. Uh, because, you know, I can't imagine the systems operating in a way that would allow you to prevent human error, which is primarily, you know, particularly in the healthcare space where I've spent most of my career. Um, you know, it is one of those places where almost all the data is hand entered or has as a byproduct of a individual or a person entering that data. Mm -hmm. um, and is probably in terms of data quality industry perspective, one of the most critical places we get that right. And, and so those two things are just enormously at conflict. Um, so I, I really encourage organizations to think a lot about data quality and construct what would be, you know, probably more pragmatic ways of thinking about data quality. But one thing I wanted to make sure was clear is that there, and this is always fascinating to me when I talk about this in person, because people kind of like look at me like I've lost right. my mind. Heresy, right? Yes, it, which is there is no data governance without data quality, and there is no data quality without data governance. And oh, people oh. think I've lost my mind. A paradox, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and 
And and the reality is that you, you can't, it's very difficult to prove that you're doing data governance well without having something like data quality as a metric. Um, yeah. And it's very difficult to do data quality well if you don't have somebody guiding you to understand contextually what that data should, should be. Because quality is really defined by the end users and the end users are thinking about it from their point of view. And that's that fit for purpose thing that makes this a very complicated thing to execute against. Yes, and, and I suspect the notion of telling some of your clients let it go. You'll, ne you'll never get to 100. Maybe 20 is okay, right? 20% error, maybe 10% error. Depends on your industry, right? Mm -hmm. But that notion for a lot of people is like, what do you mean? It's okay to have bad data. Because I, what I've seen over and over and over again is that is if you put data quality in front of a group of technologists, it's like this Rubik's Cube that they cannot pick up. <laughs> And, and, and it just happens over and over again. So I, I'm glad both of us are on the uh, on the same page there in terms of data quality. You'll never get to 100 percent of data quality and, and, and don't try. Um, so I, I was I was interested by some of what you shared in your book related to technology. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of come from the MDM space. And mm -hmm. while I agree that uh, there is really kind of no such thing as a single version of the truth anymore. Um, I, I do from do think from a technology perspective that there is a lot of promise. You actually call that out in the book, and you, and you say that there is promise, and there's way too much data now to to ignore technology as a, right. as a tool to properly govern and to properly right. manage it. Um, what do you see out there that that's that's you, you, you're an optimist? You said that um, that's wonderful. What are some of the things out there that give you some optimism, at least from a technology perspective? Yeah. So I will say that um, I am a pessimist, but I have some optimism about <laughs> some of the aspects of data. Sounds complicated. I, well, yes. Um, so, so where I have some optimism. So we, again, when we sort of look back from a data governance perspective for a really long time, we had no tools in this space at all. Um, I could, couldn't count on both hands how many times I had personally created an Excel sheet where we did most of our data governance tracking. Yeah. You know, where we sort of back ended our way into what, you know, was considered more of a, a modern data catalog. So data catalogs are changing the game. And there is no question in my mind that technology is that lever that we need in terms of our, you know, that scale, right? That ability to do the things that we need to do with petabytes of data. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of excite, exciting things that are happening in that space. Um, the ability to have lots of people look at the data and weight it so we know what is being used more often than others and flag it if there's questions and concerns. And one of the things that I think from a quality perspective, and this is all sort of related to data governance, of course, is more eyeballs on the data, better data. And so from a data governance perspective, if you're not focusing on usage of the data, then what are you doing? And, and, and really, you could say this about almost any aspect of, of data as a, as a function in your organization. But if, if you're not focusing on getting people using the data, then what are you doing? Um, and, and again, tools can help us with that. They cannot solve all of our problems. So really, a lot of the time I get called is when they've been trying to do this for a really long time and can't get traction. They bought a tool, implemented it, and it didn't magically fix all their problems. Um, or my personal favorite, they've spent the last three and a half years collecting all of their metadata, and now they want to know what they should do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, these are, are, are all problems that can be solved with some, some thinking about process and, and people and the culture of an organization and, and a way less focus on the technology. Well, so you are getting into now. We're transitioning into the answer, into the solution, which you recommend at the at the end of of your book, which uh, is in essence at a very high level what you call the radical democratization of data. So you you just said that in the get more eyes on mm -hmm. is better. Mm -hmm. You just said the more adopted a data solution, for lack of a better phrase, a data solution, a data product, a report, a little, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the more adopted it is, the better it will be um, because there's, you know, in theory, there'd be value there. So 
help our listeners kind of understand. Let's go into a little more depth around what does radical democratization sound like, or what does that actually, what form does that actually take? What are the three or four things that a CDO would know if should know if he or she was was interested at at, at following your model? Yeah. Uh, so the first thing, and you know, we love we love data, of course. So we'd love to have data about our programs. But one of the biggest things that I see is the hallmark, sort of a leading indicator, is you just start getting more questions. You just start getting more questions, and the questions aren't, how do I get this? You know, how do I get access to this tool? It is, hey, I saw the data, and I'm curious about X, Y, or Z. You just start getting more questions. And one of the things I always want, you know, CDOs to think about is. It, the way they respond to those questions lays the groundwork for everything that they do in the future. Mm. If, if they, if they respond to that question with, we'll get back to you and then they never get back to them. Um, then you lost that person as a, as a possible champion for your, you know, for your uh, work. Uh, if you get excited, even if somebody comes to you and says the data is wrong, which of course every data person cringes. How many times I've heard that? There's a million reasons why they're seeing something and probably has nothing to do with the data. But we are we have historically been very bad about that response, right? We're just like, oh the data's not wrong, it's blah blah blah. You know? We mm -hmm. just have to get really good about saying, that's awesome. Thank you. Let's talk about that. Because when you start to get more questions and that means people are looking and when that person has this conversation with you and you get an opportunity to explain what happened and then that person goes to the next person and says, you know, I actually talked to her about that and um, this is what happened and, you know, I think they're going to, you know, fix it or it doesn't need to be fixed or what have you, right? It's laying that groundwork. Another way to think about it, which the analogy that my son likes the most is to think about it like a car engine. Right. If you don't have fuel and the fuel is the people using the data, then your car is never going to go anywhere. And for a really long time, what we've done in data governance in particular is sort of said, I am the keeper of all this. I know what is correct. I will give it to you when I you know, think it's appropriate to give it to you. And then we wonder why they don't interact with us and why all of the things that we work so hard to deliver aren't adopted because we haven't created any relationship that would allow us to have a community, you know, a conversation about what that thing could or should be. And so the first thing I think, you know, I help organizations understand is if you start getting questions, even if you hate the questions, that is the first sign that you're actually democratizing your data. Uh, and, and then the other things are just straight up like usage. You start to see more people using the products. You start to see these things pop up in, in meetings that you didn't anticipate. Uh, those are all areas where if you can start to get more eyeballs on the data and keep that line of communication open, uh, you might actually have a shot at um, you know making all of the making all of your data dreams come true. Another thing that I would throw out, and, and you tell me if I'm correct here, is is that um, another thing that CDO should be thinking about is, and I'm paraphrasing now, is kind of governance by design. Right, the notion of maybe DevOps or data gov ops, where as a part of a change management process, which could be a new policy, it could mm -hmm. be building new software, it could be whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of change management in today's modern organizations, but as a part of a change management process, that there's governance built into that in this kind of this collaborative back and forth with the role that you are calling the data ambassador. I, mm -hmm. I assume that is the, the person that is taking these questions, that is taking the feedback about the data that's working and not working. But but do, do you agree with my paraphrasing? Do, do, do you see you know a, a high functioning governance organization as one that is kind of wired into the change management process? Absolutely. I mean, okay. data governance is change management, and I talk a fair amount about how to manage change in the book. And I think I even sort of um, talk a little bit about data ops or data gov ops and what that could look like. Now any kind of hashtag ops thing, right? <laughs> is yeah. more about um, environment and and methods than it is about, uh, so hinting at the process aspect of it, um, then it really is about the people and, and you know, what we traditionally like to think about like policies and data governance, which is a whole other conversation. Um, and, it, and it's not necessarily about the technology either. It's, it's really about how do you constantly introduce uh, change in your data governance space. Love it. 
So let's transition. Uh, let's in our last five minutes or, or so, um, I, I'd love to touch on, on one last subject, um, which should be worthy of another co conversation. So maybe we can use this as a, as a placeholder for another conversation. But kind of, kind of getting away from your, your your wonderful book that I would most certainly recommend, um, and and talking about the gender gap that exists within in technology. I mean, it's, it, you you can't be in the space and not see it on a day to day basis. I I want to I want to quote one more thing from from your book because it just it, it to me it summarized. Obviously, you know, it can't be my personal experience, but it summarized a lot of the experiences that I've heard others that I've worked with over the years. I'm quoting you now. It says, I'm not a technologist. I'm actually an analyst by training. Moreover, I'm a woman in a male-dominated industry, which shouldn't matter, but it does. I censor myself when it comes to technology to avoid the inevitable know-it-all bullying. I'm talking about the person who will rate this book as a failure because I didn't go deep into some arbitrary technology or explain in nauseating detail the danger of Cartesian joints. I read that and I'm like, <laughs> mic drop, right? Like if, if I could launch some, some fireworks, I would do it right now. I would be dropping mics. I'd be like, I, cause I've been in that conference room where mm. I've seen that happen, sure. right? Like you may think you know something, but let's talk about ABC esoteric, really kind of yeah. like deep level of technology. You know, I'll see your technology knowledge and I'll raise you factor 10 technology knowledge yeah. to shut you down. I've, I've seen that. I've been in that room when it's happened. Sure. Um, so I found that really refreshing. But in your role as a leader, in your role as a consultant, in your role working with large organizations, how, how, do, how do we kind of close the gender gap, right? How do we, how do we have less of those meetings? How do we get more equity in, 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 in compensation and roles and opportunity within the technology space. And I know that that's that in five minutes, that's right. we'll never solve for that, but, yeah. but in, in maybe in Twitter like style here, <laughs> you, can go, you can go more than 140 characters, but, but, you know, as, as maybe a segue into an additional conversation, what, what are some of the things that you would want the rest of the, of the, the world of CDOs to know? Yeah, well, so first and foremost, thank you for asking the question. Um, I, I think that just like with almost anything in the data industry, if we're not willing to face these things and have the discussions about them, then we're never going to improve them. You know, you can't fix what you won't face. So um, so first and foremost, the just the opportunity to kind of talk about it is, is really uh, important. Uh, you know, I think where I, I see a shift. I definitely see a shift. Uh, and so, you know, when you think about somebody that is my age in terms of, I think we were Gen X or something like that, the generation that doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> and how long I've been, I know, right? Here I am. Um, and how long I've been doing this work, I, you know, there have been way more situations that I've had and stories I couldn't, I couldn't share on a podcast because of the rating. And, and these are common references to body parts kind of stuff, you know? And, and it's like, you never would have thought to even ask the question back then about like, what, did that make you uncomfortable, Laura? Mm. <laughs> um, so, so we have made improvements and I, and I sometimes feel like we don't acknowledge at least that. So we have, thank you for asking the question and we have made improvements, but we still have a long way to go. And I think probably the biggest thing that I have learned as a white person is it's intentional. It's intentionality. It's making yourself uncomfortable, realizing that you have some culpability there, owning that and moving forward and being really intentional about that. Um, and I think that's true for, for you know, from a gender side, which is the only part that I can really speak to. Um, so uh, yeah, intentionality. And, and when you see situations where, you know, some woman is being gaslighted, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> Uh, to the degree that you're comfortable, you know, facing that conversation and, and helping come to her aid uh, if you're comfortable in that situation it depends on, you know, lots of variables. So how's that for a non-answer? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a real, it's a real answer. Cause I encountered this last week and it was with, it was in a, a partner setting. It wasn't an internal setting. So it wasn't, it, it was, it was a partner during a conversation, but I was like, wow, that was not cool. Mm -hmm. And, and I found myself, it's like, okay, wait a minute. Do, do I challenge now? Do I challenge offline? What, what, what do I do? And, um, 
I mean, I, 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 I want to do better and I want to be intentional to, to your sure. word. That's, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask the question today. So sure. clearly there's no easy answers here, but I, I know just from personal experience that, that these things will come up mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, yes, awareness is, is key. So that's good. Yeah. Um, but then where, where do we go? Um, so, so not expecting any magic answers today, but I, I couldn't thank you more for, for your time. I, I really enjoyed your conversation. I really enjoyed your, your book. Um, I, I really enjoyed some of the kind of the pragmatic aspects to it. I also enjoyed the, Hey, we've been doing this for two decades and it's not working. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of what I share when, in, in my conversations with my clients as well. It's time, it's time to look at things differently. I do like the notion of, of modernness, and, and I think we, we should be applying that uh, more broadly across everything we do. But again, couldn't thank you more for your time, Laura Madsen. Thank you so much. Again, I would urge folks to, to, to go and, and, and get Laura's book around uh, Disrupting Data Governance. It's, it's a fantastic read, and I would look forward to additional conversations in the future. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right, with that, we will sign off. Thank you so much for listening and watching this episode of CDO Matters, and we will see you on a future episode sometime very soon.